Today is Monday, the 27th of February. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Now let's begin with this. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that our consensus has been, our prediction in this channel has been, that the economy will end up being in stagflation. And I made this prediction back in Q1 of 2021. And what we see in the economy today is exactly that. We see sticky inflation. On the other hand, we continue to see deteriorating economic conditions. The combination of both is stagflation, and it is the worst economic phenomenon. And the reason is, to tackle the inflation part, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, will have to raise interest rates significantly higher to extract the excess demand out of the economy. Now, we know that there is no surgical way to extract the excess demand alone without damaging or destroying demand in the economy as a whole. And this damage will come on top of an already weakening economy. And therefore, our stance has been from the get-go that the Fed remains behind the curve. And it is best for the Fed to be aggressive in the beginning by raising interest rates aggressively higher to tackle the inflation problem while the economy can still absorb the shock. Yet the longer they wait, the more damage the economy will have to endure and the more sticky inflation will become. And tightening the monetary policy under these conditions will produce more damage for the economy. What is supposed to be perhaps a mild recession will turn out to be a severe one due to the incompetency of the Federal Reserve. And we continue to see in this uh, stock market that we have an addiction mentality where the market gets excited by bad economic news, not good economic news. Why are we seeing that? The answer is because if we have good economic news, it indicates that the economy perhaps can still absorb more aggression by the Fed to tackle inflation down. But if the economy is too weak and we have more bad news in the economy, it means that perhaps the Fed will have no other choice but to halt its fighting campaign against inflation. Now, of course, in this channel, we continue to believe that this is a fantasy because the Fed has a mandate to reduce reduce inflation all the way down to 2%. Whether they're going to do this while the economy can still absorb the shock or when an economy can no longer absorb the shock, it doesn't matter. They have to get inflation down. But in the meantime, the market continues to be in this mentality of good news equals bad news and bad news equals good news. Rallying on the heels of bad news, selling off on the heels of good news or shall we say high inflation news. For example, when we got hot employment data, when we got hot retail sales data and accompanying that hot inflation data, the stock market sold off. But today, for example, the stock market caught a bid, at least in the morning. What was the reason behind that? We got the news that durable good orders went down big in the month of January. Although, if we dig in the details, absent of aircraft demand, durable good orders actually went significantly higher in the month of January, indicating more and more inflation coming in the pipeline. But what really took the value of the dollar down and bind yields down, two indicators of more Fed aggression. If they go higher, they go down. It means that the Fed will not be as aggressive. And of course, the algorithms for the stock market, once they see the dollar and bond yields going down, they start buying the stock market and moving it higher. And this is exactly what we saw today. But it was not due to durable orders. We saw the dollar moving down significantly, while stock market futures shooting up higher the moment we got this news by the Dallas Fed. The Dallas Fed manufacturing index went down by minus 13.5 versus 9 0.3%, which was the estimate. The prior reading was minus 8.4, so we have a deteriorating economy here, according to the Dallas Fed. And listen to this, this is really important. New orders fell further into contraction. On the other hand, prices paid ticked higher alongside wages, work week. So you have new orders, the underlying conditions of the economy moving down, while prices paid and wages moving higher. Inflation moving higher, pace of economic activity moving down, hence stagflation. And and to solidify that, of course, on Friday, we got PC inflation data. And we got the hottest reading, the biggest gain for PC inflation since June 2022. In other words, there is no disinflation process in the economy. We actually have inflation moving higher again, while the economy continues to get weaker and weaker and weaker. All of this delusion by the market that the Fed will somehow be intimidated because, yes, inflation is sticky. Yes, inflation is rebounding. But, oh, the economy is getting a lot weaker. Understand this. The Fed is not in charge. The Fed will follow what inflation feeds them. And right now, to defeat inflation, they have to turn a blind eye to the damage that's going on in the economy right now and be more aggressive in tackling inflation down. And this outcome will be absolutely
absolutely disastrous for the stock market and the economy. But rest assured, your uh, beloved C9 leaders, they got everything under control here. For example, the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, said, So far, so good in U.S. inflation battle. And I say, um... What the hell are you talking about, Mrs. Yellen? You have absolutely no clue what you're talking about. And by the way, she said this while she was in Kiev, Ukraine, handing out more of your taxpayer money over there in money laundering schemes. But I know, God forbid you ask any questions and uh, you're called the conspiracy theorist, the same way they called the folks who uh, suggested that perhaps the thing came out of a lab in China. The next thing you know is, whoops, I guess those uh, conspiracy theorists were right all along. <laughs> We're only allowed to say that now that nobody's paying attention. Wait till they reveal the entire truth behind this whole Ukraine thing. Wait till they reveal the truth about this economy. They keep telling us, oh, we can have a soft landing. This is the beginning of a new bull market. Keep swiping those credit cards. Don't be concerned about the level of debt that Americans are racking. That's all good. That's all fine. The consumer remains resilient. Don't underestimate the power of the U.S. economy. Blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe you should uh, underestimate the power of the United States economy because we have incompetent senile fools behind the policy making in this country. Look no further than uh, Clown Powell, the chairman of the Fed, who has absolutely no clue what he's doing. He said uh, inflation is going to be transitory, transitory, transitory. And even when it became clear that inflation is not transitory, he kept saying that uh, he's not even thinking about thinking about thinking about raising rates or normalizing the monetary policy until inflation got out of hand. And it became clear that it is not transitory. Now he keeps saying disinflation, disinflation, disinflation. Meanwhile, every piece of data we get suggests that inflation is actually rebounding higher again. Look, I have no problem with the guy. I'm pretty sure he's a lovely man as we talked in last night's video. But the man is not competent enough to lead the Federal Reserve. The man will lead this economy into an absolute disaster. Everything that he has done so far in raising rates to almost 5% right now did absolutely nothing to tie in financial conditions. We continue to see financial conditions moving higher again to loosening territory, which means the fight against inflation is getting out of hand here. The Federal Reserve is losing to inflation. 5% is nothing now. They have to go to six, seven, eight, and that's going to ensure that the economy will blow up for years to come. Chairman Powell says, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem here with the loosening of financial conditions. I actually see a significant tightening. Well, perhaps Chairman Powell needs new glasses because here's the point when he announced that, oh, it is time to retire a transitory. We saw financial conditions indeed tightening, but they only tighten if the rating goes above zero. And this is according to the Chicago Fed's National Financial Conditions Index. We we never got to a rating above zero. All in all, financial conditions went from extra loose to a little bit loose. And now they're moving down again to extra loose. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're losing the fight against inflation because we do have a weak Federal Reserve. And that would open the possibility that the Fed will have to do a lot of catching up later on. And when they do, when they finally recognize that this is stagflation and they have no other choice but to hold their noses, ignore the collapse of the economy, the hundreds of thousands of jobs being lost, the deteriorating and collapsing, manufacturing PMIs, for example, they have to ignore all of that and concentrate on bringing inflation down to 2% because inflation is sticking higher, not going down. When they do that, you're going to see a crash in the stock market like you have never seen before. And the Fed will not come to the rescue. The Fed will actually be the culprit of the crash. And therefore, we continue to see these increasing bets, betting that the VIX, the volatility index, will explode higher by the summer. Now, why would the VIX go higher? Stock market crash. And we have the mystery trader who was famous back in 2018. Now, I think he had a couple of trades in 2020. 20 and 21. The trader is known as 50 Cent and he's known as that because he buys these uh, way out of the money call options, put options at 50 cents a piece. And usually his prediction comes out to light. And recently 50 Cent bought about 100,000 call options at 50 cents each that the VIX will explode above 50 by May. And then he bought yet another 50,000 contracts for the same bid. Someone in the vast world of financial markets is bidding big that US equities will run into heavy turbulence in the coming months. That someone may be the trader nicknamed 50 Cent, who has in the past positioned themselves to make money off the market.
market volatility by way of consistently buying CBOE volatility index options that usually costs about 50 cents. Now, the VIX is known as the fear index, quote unquote, in Wall Street, gauging the expected volatility of U.S. stock market. The anonymous trader has seized attention with major bets before, including a $200 million wager during a wild time in the markets in February 2018 during the volume get in phenomenon. Now we have talks that we're going to see volume get in 2.0 due to the mania that we've seen in the market so far, due to the zero date till expiration phenomenon, the madness that's going on in the markets right now due to the Fed being way behind the curve, about to play catch-up and damage the economy even more. The bets are increasing. They were about to see volume get in 2.0. Whoever 50 cent may be, they're anticipating a sizable surge in the VIX as it currently sits at around 13-month low. The VIX on Thursday soared 10% to push above 20. It was still down about 7% so far this year, while the S&P 500 gained more than 6%. The anonymous trader may be anticipating among a laundry list of market factors a ramp up in anxiety around interest rates, which recent inflation readings showing consumer and wholesale prices have been slow to come down year over year, and even signs of a pickup in prices on a monthly basis. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now. And my hunch is that 50 Cent did up the ante today, and he went from 50 bucks, the prediction of the VIX popping above 50, to now 65. Today, we saw quite an unusual trade in the VIX. Somebody bought about 10,000 contracts of the 65 calls with the expiration date in July, costing about 50 cents apiece. When we look at the options grid for the expiration date in July for the VIX, it stands out. The 65 calls contract caught a bid, about 10,000 contracts open today, while other contracts, pretty much nothing happened. Muted. This signifies the unusual nature of this trade, as perhaps somebody knowing something. And if you thought 65 was bad, wait till you hear what's going on right now. Folks are now betting that the VIX will crack above 75. Investors are bracing for a surge in market volatility. One of the biggest wagers tied to the VIX is for the index to hit 75 within the next month, a level only previously seen during stock market crashes. Another popular bet sees the VIX reaching 40 in the coming months, a level that has not been breached since 2020. Meanwhile, rekindled hedging demand has increased the cost of equity put options aiming to shield investors from a downturn in the S&P 500. Folks, I told you, put options are about to become more expensive. Use the fact that the VIX is below 20 to hedge your portfolios. Use the fact that the VIX is below 20 to initiate short bets because they're not going to be cheap for too long. And now that we're seeing demand on hedging, put options are becoming expensive again. Recently, those options reached the most expensive since October for the nation's QDEX, which tracks wagers against the Spider S&P 500 exchange traded fund that would play out in the event of a large market decline. The moral of the story is we have a dangerous combination here between a senile, incompetent leadership combined with absolute absolute lunacy, absolute reckless behavior by the consumer, by stock market investors, racking an insane amount of debt, gambling in the stock market, buying the most overvalued stocks, the most indebted stocks, while interest rates are moving higher. The combination of both will indeed lead to the VIX exploding significantly higher, and a major, major market crash will follow. And with that out of the way, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today, and uh, here we go. The Dow Jones was positive for the day by 72.17 points or a gain of 0.22%. The Nasdaq leading the pack to the upside by 72.4 points worth of gains or advancing by about 0.63%. The S&P 500 also positive by 12.20 points or a gain of 0.31%. When we look at the sector's performances today, leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal, cyclicals, and this is due to the outperformance of Tesla today. Tesla outperforms due to mechanical reasons, of course. We have a lot of call options buying uh, due to the hype of uh, the revelations that Elon Musk is about to do this week. I'm still waiting for the robo taxes, by the way. Anyhow, at number two for the silver metal, industrials. Number three for the bronze, materials. And the laggard for the day is utilities. No demand for the defensive sector of utilities. Yes, rates were down, but all in all, they're moving higher. So there is no point here in buying utilities at all. When we look at the advanced decline ratios, the NYC 55% advancing versus 44% decline. 
declining. The Nasdaq 53% advancing versus 44% declining. On Friday, the ratios were suppressed to the downside. Now we're back almost to the neutral line. So whatever goes here, we could go down big again. We could blast higher again. But the odds say if the dollar and yields continue to move higher, the ratios will get ugly again. On to futures. We'll look at energy futures, be it the Brent or the WTI. Muted reactions today, be it to the downside. Losses under 1% apiece. We'll look at gasoline and heating oil futures. All positive, be it modestly, with both scoring gains north of about half a percentage point. Yet the notable gainer remains natural gas, aka the party boys back. Knock wood at least for now. Scoring gains worth about 7% today. Now, as I said, the dollar was up, then it went down, confusing action by the dollar, and therefore we don't have any guidance here for metals futures to move one way or the other. And therefore, we have a mixed picture, with gold futures being slightly up, on the other hand, silver futures being slightly down. Copper is the major gainer here, closing with gains worth about one and a quarter percent, but it is second to platinum, which managed to score gains worth about 3.3%. And of course, we're all waiting on further guidance by the dollar. If the dollar pops higher again, metals will go down and vice versa. When we look at a certain basket of grains and softs. The notable action comes from oats. When it comes to grains, oats down by about four and a half percent. We also have wheat down by about two percent. On the other hand, the gainer come from uh, softs futures led by OJ. OJ has been on a run so far this year and today it managed to score gains worth about eight percent in a single day. Likewise, sugar futures shooting up higher this year and today it scored gains worth about four percent notice the prices at the grocery store for orange juice and sugar they're going to continue to move higher from this point on on the other hand when it comes to meats no notable activities here besides uh, lean hogs futures moving down by about 1.35 percent On to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? Believe it or not, all in all, the volume is down. And we're now seeing more buying of puts versus calls, indicating that the VIX will indeed move higher, indicating that we have uh, perhaps a reckoning coming soon. Be it that, the hottest table is Tesla, the souffle, with around 1.8 million contracts traded today. About 57% of those were calls. And at number two, AMC. And AMC call options did experience huge surge in volume today. The catalyst could be earnings coming out tomorrow, could be short covering, could be of course the court in Delaware making a decision about the lawsuit by AMC investors against management for the spinoff called the uh, Ape, the ticker Ape. They don't like it anymore. Whatever the catalyst might be, we know mechanically a surge in call options volume will cause a gamma squeeze and therefore AMC was up by about 23% for the day. And the volume was high, high, high at around 1.8 million contracts traded today. Although we actually saw a lot of buying of puts versus calls. Almost 58% of the volume were puts, not calls. So how do we explain the fact that AMC is experiencing a gamma squeeze when the majority of contracts are actually sold as puts, not calls? The answer is the short-term options, the surge in volume that we've seen today, did come from weekly call options. Yet we see a lot of folks buying puts down the line, betting that whatever pop we got today will fade out in the weeks to come. We'll see who's right here, but at number three, Apple with around uh, 700,000 contracts, traded today about 52 percent of those were puts not calls and i want to pay your attention here to the ticker lazr luminar i'm a fan of the company yet it is overvalued so i would never own the stock at this stage even though we got some bad uh, good news excuse me of the company signing a multi-billion dollar deal with mercedes-benz this is initiating a short squeeze slash a gamma squeeze and maybe maybe the squeeze will continue for a little while and i only say that because i saw a huge increase in the open interest for the 11 bucks calls with the expiration date of this Friday, but also for the 12 and a half calls with the expiration date of March 17th. Now, when we look at the weekly chart for LAZR Luminar, my resistance number is around 11.40. If this gamma squeeze continues for a little while, we could see the name moving higher and scoring gains worth about 28 and a half percent or so. Do whatever you see fit with this information. If you want to chase the gamma squeeze, you got a target in hand. If you want to play the other way around and wait for it to pop higher and then buy put options, then you got to look at for 11.4. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the casino today, we begin with the ticker SLB. One of the names that we love in this channel has been pretty good for me, but somebody sees more gains to 
income. And they bought the 65 calls for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that SLB will move higher and gain more than 19.5% by then. They paid around 35 cents apiece tenor. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.2 million. Now what about the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? Now, this could be a bet against the SPY. It could also be a hedge because somebody bought the 330 puts for the expiration date, April 6th, with expectations. The SPY will move down and lose more than 17% of its value by then. They paid around 37 cents apiece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $1 million. Last but not least, what about the ticker CUBE? This is quite unusual. Somebody knows something here. Somebody's anticipating a major move higher for CUBE, Cube Smart, and they bought the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that the name will move higher and gain more than 7% by then. They paid around one buck and 25 cents apiece, Tanner. This trade, all in all, spending around $1 million. On to the heat map. What do we see here? Mixed picture across the board no notable theme one way or the other we have a few rebounds here and there in the big cap technology stocks apple microsoft google amazon although meta was the underperformer and of course tesla advanced higher by about five and a half percent my hunch is we will see by the rumor sell the news after the revelations quote unquote is out of the way another notable gainers uh, unp in industrials this is uh, union pacific also moved higher due to earnings and then we have the travel names booking.com uh, expedia also moving higher. Of course, Bookings.com reported earnings recently. We also see some positive activities in energy, specifically in the refiners, be it VLO, Valero, or MPC Marathon all moving higher. Likewise, with the dollar moving down today, we see certain metals moving higher. But besides that, when we look at the laggards we have in financials, the ticker SCHW for Charles Schwab, that's down big. Likewise, in uh, technology, we have Square giving up some of the gains after earnings, down about 3%. Yet the notable losers, in pharmaceuticals, Eli Lilly down about 1.5% today, and Pfizer continues to collapse. Today we got the news that Pfizer may be buying CGEN, the ticker SGEN, and therefore Pfizer is down big. Now I told you folks that if Pfizer goes below 40, I will probably move away from Pfizer and buy more AbV. It appears that AbV right now holding a lot better than Pfizer and the rest of the pharmaceuticals. Now here are some uh, corporate news for you. We begin with the tsunami of layoffs, this time around in Italy, because the company Stellantis is now planning to cut as many as 2,000 jobs in Italy. When we talk about the tsunami of layoffs, even Palantir, a government contractor, is now cutting about 2% of employees. And this comes, of course, a few weeks later, after scam artist Palantir CEO Alex Karp announced that Palantir is stronger than the rest. As a matter of fact, they're looking to hire more talent, not fire. Of course, we know that Alex Karp is a notorious stock dumper. He pumps, pumps, pumps. He lowers the retail market and pops in and then he backs them and he dumps shares and he dumped hundreds of millions of dollars worth of shares right on top of the heads of the mom and pop retail investors and if you thought that's bad look at blackstone ceo who is getting rewarded by one billion dollars in pay while the stock is crashing while the company's earnings the worst earnings report right after intel this season and the ceo is getting rewarded by one billion dollars they never lose folks for them this is a win-win game they treat the stock market as a pound scheme they pump their stocks higher they get the mom pops the pension funds in and then they bag them they don't care if the stock goes down or not they don't care if the stock goes higher or not it doesn't matter to them it's all about using the equity value as a ponzi scheme to get rich and lastly we have news from ford now we have a lot of problems from ford because they halted the production of the f-150 lightning due to battery fires but ford says nothing to see here no need to be concerned everything is fine uh the battery is catching fire <laughs> That, that's rare. That's not going to happen. Maybe medium rare. Maybe it happens once in a while. But come on, stop selling the stock. Anyways, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Green across the board for the most part with growth at performing value in a day when yields are down, in a day when the dollar is down. What do we see? We see energy at performing, XLE, XOP, OIH moving higher. We see technology at performing, the XLK, chips, the SMH also moving higher. Gold, gold miners, the GDX, eking some gains today. And of course, materials, the XME moved higher by about 2.5%. But international markets also outperform. Chinese equities are up. 
European equities are up, yet the biggest winner by far is natural gas, be it the ticker UNG or BOIL scoring major gains today. And of course, my advice is if you make big gains trading boil, take some profits and buy the dip in natural gas stocks if you still believe that this is the bottom in nat gas. Because when the futures go down by a little bit, a pullback, 1-2%, boil is gonna go down big. All of a sudden your call options are worthless again. All of a sudden your gains went down big. So why not lock them in and rotate them to something more stable, such as a stock or even the futures, it doesn't matter. But that's just my strategy. Do whatever you see fit with your own money. Now let's do some charts and then wrap it up and we begin with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? We did have a gap and crap because we gapped higher. We did close positive but beat the lows of the day. And most importantly, when we look at the 30 minutes chart, we have a bear flag consolidation pattern that did play out and the SPY lost 398 as support by the end of the day. Now I did talk about a lotto ticket trade which is basically buying the SPXS, the 20 calls with the weekly expirations. Again, it's a lotto ticket. Don't get in unless you're okay with losing all of your money. You're not going to bet the house, the wife and the kids on this one. The SPXS of course is the high levered bear index for the SPX. Meaning if the S&P 500 goes down by 1% in a single day, the SPXS will appreciate by 3% in that given day. Why do I say this? Number one, the SPY of course formed the bear flag pattern and I did share this chart at the time it was a one hour chart and it was consolidating in a bear flag pattern now we know by the end of the day the bear flag did play out but also when we look at the SPX the cash index we got a double rejection at least from the most important number of 4,000 this is of course the chart that I did tweet when I uh, issued this uh, suggestion for the lottery ticket but here's the update of course the SPX pulled down significantly since then but it did not break below the support of 3,970 in other words we could see yet another attempt in cracking above 4,000. I think we've seen enough. I think uh, the SPX had plenty of time to go above 4,000. It doesn't have the energy. Every time it trades above 4,000, we see these uh, large institutional trades with zero day till expiration, buying the 4,000 puts. And immediately we see the SPX moving down. So if this continues and the SPX loses 3,970 by the end of the week, the trade for the SPXS will appreciate handsomely. But bear in mind, it is a lot of ticket. You could lose everything. It's not a serious trade at all. But here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P. What do we see here? No update at all. Within range, the resistance remains 4,037. The support remains 3,960. We need a break either way. Although we have the RSI continuing in uh, a negative divergence, we have the MACD indicator still showing negative momentum. So the bias is we're going to crack below 3,960 absent of a rescue operation happening as soon as possible. What about the Qs? 30 minutes. Here it is. We have a gap. Not quite the crap that we've seen in the SPY, for example. Be it the Q's consolidated, holding on to 294.33 as support, but by the end of the day, it did close below this number. So we're going to give this one to the bears here, even though it was a positive day all in all. When we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Q's, what do we see? No update so far. It did run a retest today at the resistance at 12,207 and could not make it. Can it give it another shot by tomorrow? Of course. But at the end of the day, if the chart doesn't have the energy to crack above this number, then we're going to go down to the next support, which is all the way down at 11,689. What about the IWM small caps, Russell 2000, 30 minutes. Again, we have the gap and crap, not closing negative, but closing at the lows of the day and almost losing the support of 188. Now, if the IWM continues to lose momentum here, we do have soft support at 186, but the ultimate support is all the way down at 183. But it all depends on the dollar, of course. And right away, when we look at the Dixie, 30 minutes chart, you can see the sensitivity of the algos. Every time the Dixie moves down, equities move higher. But every time we see major big tick ups in the dollar, we see equities moving down big. And today I said that I'm looking for the Dixie to rebound from 104.58. And from that point for equities to move back to retest critical support levels. Now, the Dixie did rebound from a slightly lower number, but it doesn't matter. It was a zone within that range. We got the big rebound, as you can see from the 30 minutes chart of the dollar. When that pop happened, immediately the SPX went down back to 4,000. The Qs, the IWM all moved down to their major support lines. When we look at the dollar daily chart, we do have a pullback. I say this is good for the bears. We're talking about equities bears because the dollar was getting overbought. Just look at the RSI, look at the MACD indicator. If the dollar continued to shoot up higher, 
impulsively, then the risk becomes to the downside that whatever piece of data we get next that shows perhaps a cooling down in inflation, we could have seen a major pullback in the dollar and a major pop in equities. But now that the dollar is working out the overbought conditions on the daily via consolidating and maintaining support, this means that once the overbought conditions on the dollar from a daily chart perspective are fixed, the chart is ready to move higher again. We did cover the weekly chart of the Dixie in last night's video. But if that is the case, what happens to gold? Gold is oversold from a daily chart perspective. The question becomes, is it going to fix the oversold conditions by recapturing 1,842 as support, or is it going to stop short of that? And then we see the dollar rebounding and gold moving down again, something we have to look out for. Securing support is really important. So the dollar must secure 1,842 in fixing the oversold conditions here. What about Brent Oil, a daily chart? Again, no major update, maintaining support lines, but not making a higher high, which keeps it at risk that we are seeing a rising head and shoulder formation, which would eventually move uh, the chart all the way down to 77 as support, if not below that. When it comes to the 10-year yield, the daily chart, what do we see here? A pullback day. Again, we look at the RSI, the MACD indicators, all overbought, quote-unquote. So the chart has to fix some of these overbought conditions and the best way they can do it is via consolidating because that indicates another leg higher coming when we look at the weekly chart to begin with we can see perhaps the beginning of a new bullish momentum if you look at the macd indicator for example it appears that the bearish momentum is bottoming and we're about to start a new fresh bullish momentum likewise we have a pattern of higher lows and lower highs which was broken to the upside indicating that the 10 year wants to challenge the highs once again maybe it needs to pull back a little bit maybe for a few days and then pop higher again what does that make for the tlt a daily chart again we could see a rebound in the tlt all the way to 103 and a half as we see the 10 year yield pulling back and working those uh, overbought conditions but on the weekly chart as you've seen with the 10 year it appears that it wants to move higher we covered the weekly chart for the tlt in last night's video it appears that it wants to move down what about the vix four hours chart what do we see here we have the pattern of lower highs and static lows for now. Another way we can look at it is, what if this is a bull flag pattern? What supports this outlook is when we switch to the weekly chart for the VIX, we look at the MACD indicator, what do we see here? A beginning of a new positive momentum. We haven't seen positive momentum from a weekly chart perspective in the VIX since October of last year, which by the way coincided with the October bottom in equities. So if the VIX is about to start new bullish momentum from a weekly chart perspective, shouldn't we say that equities are about to start a new bearish momentum from a weekly chart perspective and maybe this validates the trade by 50 cent and maybe it will also validate the trade by me that we will see the spy going down by the end of the week what about apple 30 minutes the big kahuna what do we see here in the morning brief i talked about 147 and a half as an important resistance level but we got an overshoot in the futures so i said when the dollar pops higher from that particular level you're gonna see all of these charts most of them at least moving down back to what we call the critical resistance levels now is support in the case of apple it went down to 147 and a half it did catch support but no decisive action here to say okay this is solid support and now apple is going to move higher to challenge 150 as resistance once again for now looking at the 30 minutes beating the rsi or the macd they're all suggesting that apple could go down and run another retest at 147 and a half then take it from there a break below indicates that we're going to go down all the way to the original destination of 145 but if that support is kept we talking about 147 and a half then apple could make it another retest to 150 although we know that 150 is the no entry zone what about tesla the souffle 30 minutes what do we see here we have a major gap higher the event is coming this week the revelations are coming this week buy the rumor sell the news and now tesla's all the way back to the trend line didn't quite make it but good enough for the bulls for now to encourage more and more call options buying and today from my observation i saw a lot of demand for the 210 for the 220 even 250 with the expiration date of this week now if you know anything about elon musk uh, just like the revelations of doge during the infamous saturday night live appearance which was the top for doge could the revelations this time around for tesla be the top in this run something to pay attention to when we look at tesla's chart from a weekly perspective and last night we looked at it from a monthly perspective but this is the weekly one all in all it remains in bearish momentum despite the massive rally year to date tesla remains in a bear market 
territory. Unless it cracks above the critical level of let's say 210, 220, and it closes above that level for the week, we are still in a bear market territory for Tesla. Last but not least, what about Bitcoin, the daily chart? What do we see here? I continue to see negative divergence on the RSI, weakening momentum from the MACD indicator perspective. Yes, the chart is holding on to the support of 23,189, but I continue to see it breaking below this support and going all the way down to 20,593.34 support. But folks, I've been wrong before and I could be wrong again. So I'm telling you right now, don't take my word for it. Do your own homework and assess whether this could be a consolidation phase for Bitcoin before we see another leg higher coming. That is, of course, should be contingent on the dollar moving down. Not only that, but also yields moving down. Then we're going to have the risk on environment in which Bitcoin can initiate these massive pops higher. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have uh, retail inventories. We have the trade balance in goods. We have wholesale inventories. We also have the S&P case chiller home price index. But most importantly, we have the Chicago business barometer, the consumer confidence reading. And we have the new Fed president from Chicago, Austin Goldsby. He's speaking tomorrow. Let's see what he thinks about all of this. He's a mixed character did work for the Obama administration, but also worked under Volcker back in the day. So it'd be really interesting to hear what he has to say. But with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. It's not beginning the story that I fear. It's not knowing how it will end. Everyone is fair game now.